Oh, what's going on? Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 558. That's 558 of the Agostino Zynga Show. Hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may find you, wherever it may find you. How am I? I could do better. I could be better. I could be doing better. I could be doing many, many, many things. Number one, this bloody weight loss journey is taking far longer than what it should be taking. The scale is not moving, and clearly we know why, right? It's the scale's fault, not mine. No, no, joking. It's always the scale. It's always my fault. Always. That's a problem with weight, with weight loss because I've done it so many times. You know, when the weight's not coming off, you're doing something wrong. That's it. Simple. It's so black and white, which is probably why I haven't got no patience with fat people in general because I know how easy it is. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what I mean. <laughs> So yeah, so I'm gonna have to go back to the regular old flipping chicken and broccoli for a week and then see how that goes and then kind of add some stuff as I go on from there. But basically the weight's not coming off, it's making me annoyed, it's getting me down, but I'm still I'm still pushing through. I'm still training twice a day. I've got a double session coming up after I record this podcast, so pray for me regardless, because having to lump lug this extra weight around as i'm pushing weights as i'm running down the street isn't the easiest hearing people or seeing people kind of have a fright as i'm running behind them like <laughs> beating my flipping massive elephant feet on the fucking pavement as i'm trying to run my little 5k it kind of i understand why usually you make me feel pissed off but i get it if i saw me hurtling down the street i'll be like rotted I do not want this guy to hit me because, you know, gravity is a thing. Um, physics is a thing. I know. I get it. So that's been annoying. But apart from that, I've been cool, man. I've been blessed. I can't lie. I've been out a few times, watching football a few times here and there. You know, stuff's going up in the world. We might be encountering World War Three just over the weekend or just the other day. We had flipping Jason Lee from flipping Hollywood Unlocked trying to break the story that the Queen is dead. Who would have... Anyway like the world is going is on fire my ukraine trip to kiev might be on the flipping back burner because putin sent down some extra troops do you know what i mean to areas that he feels like are getting on top so maybe that kiev trip to pump my fist in the air listen to some techno music might have to be put on hold what else has been going on and a whole bunch of other stuff in it but i'm gonna get into it now many things to dive on into so if you haven't already grab yourself a drink and let's get in to the action into the action so first things first what did agostino do on his weekend i'll tell you dear listeners i went to a possession party at e1 one of my um more um beloved clubs in london over the last couple of years i felt like the programming has at e1 has got considerably better i feel like over the last couple of years I'm not sure if they've employed someone new there or they've changed directions but whoever's doing the programming over there you're doing a great job so big up to you nice one um i'm a big fan of possession also mostly as a promotion outfit because i did a bit of promoting myself back in the day and my promoting wasn't even to this level mine was just plugging and playing at bars you go to a bar you ask them if you can do your night there they tell you yeah you get a 10 percent split of the bar if it exceeds over 1000 pounds or whatever in revenue or whatever through the till um you book your djs to come and play you pay them if you want you don't pay them if you don't want but regardless you put on a good night you wake up a flyer bob's your uncle granny's your aunt easy but nowadays it feels like a lot of these kids coming up are proper throwing like some actual raves. They're like, you know, renting out venues, warehouses, you know, buying their own audio equipment, hiring audio, visual lighting people to come and do stuff like crazy. The levels are getting upped. But in general, I always keep an eye out for that kind of thing because on any level, whether you're organizing an exhibition, you're trying to get your friends out for a birthday party, putting on an event is difficult and getting people to come it's even harder especially if you have to make them pay like people don't like to leave their house especially in the post-pandemic era it feels like you know the the clubbing i'm going to talk about it later as well the whole clubbing and relationship with djs and artists and how you need to come up in the scene it's kind of changed it's a bit weird it's not it's not the same but anyway we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that another time so 
I'm a big fan of position. I like them. I even follow one of the girls who's kind of a behind the whole possession brand and it's now kind of evolved into a booking agency too i think they probably do other stuff that i'm probably not um involved with or i'm not aware of but in general you know i like what they do so i've always wanted to go to a party that they put on but i wanted to my first experience to be the ones that they put on in the outskirts of paris because that's where basically they got famous from where they you know they'd have these boiler rooms and people record these videos of these crazy kids going mad to this new form or this kind of uh, newer sounding uh, techno music that was getting played in these clubs which is not really new but you know what I mean fast tempo stuff and it just looked amazing especially when you're in the lockdown you see all these kids um, raving cool having a good time tops off dancing sweating their face off and you're like bam damn 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 FOMO 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 I wish that was me I wish I was catted up to my eyeballs willing and able to raise my heartbeat to ungodly levels but that obviously wasn't most of us so I was holding out to go to a Paris party but obviously you know France was going through their thing with luck with COVID that wasn't necessarily the book so I thought you know what the best thing to do would be to book whatever go to any sort of event they put on here in the UK and then just kind of do it that way and then I think two events happened to come by at the same time the tickets were made available for their festival that they have in August happening in the outskirts of Paris I'm officially supposedly should be going to I just got my holiday booked from work approved for that sort of weekend to go and then I also booked obviously the tickets to go to E1 the other weekend and um yeah man i'm not too sure if i'm gonna go to the festival now <laughs> i'm not too sure as much as i like them as a as a promotional outfit and i think what they do as a business is crazy good if i'm not mistaken again maybe i'm wrong i didn't really check too tough but i saw a couple of clips here and there from the lady who i follow online who's behind possession maybe she's one half of it i'm not too sure but i don't even think she was even there I think she was she might have been back home. I don't know, but she didn't look like she was in London. So possession is at a level now where they're operating, you know, it's such a professional outfit, that they're able to just kind of throw on parties and not be in the not be at the venue themselves and have it kind of go down, which is kind of, you know, in especially in a dance music setting, especially if you've got a party or lev a party to a level of that kind of notoriety, it's a bit unheard of of the people that are behind it not to kind of enjoy the clout and kind of stand behind a booth as well and enjoy the kind of hype and get all the adulation. So the fact that they're able just to kind of run it as a business, like kind of how a boiler room runs, right? I don't think the fans of boiler room are going to all the flipping boiler rooms that are happening all over the world, but that kind of goes to show how professional of an outfit it is, how successful it's become over the years, and maybe it also is representative of maybe the magic has somewhat been lost if they're able to kind of just bang them out to this kind of level because they're doing quite a few. It's not like they're doing, you know, a small amount now. They're just doing, they're doing bears. Um, you know, the, the one happening in August, if I'm not mistaken, the festival that I'm, I'm, I hopefully should be going to or that I'm maybe thinking I'm not going to anymore, if I'm not mistaken as well, there's like f at least maybe four other events from Possession happening between now and that festival in August. So they're literally churning them out. And I think before the lockdown happened um, in Paris or before like, you know, hospitality industry and nightlife and whatnot and clubs were allowed to, weren't allowed to open, they were putting on events on a fairly regular basis. Of course, they were able to kind of get away maybe a bit more on the outskirts of Paris because I'm assuming if it's anything, if it's anything similar to like Gomorrah, no, come on. If it's anything similar to like Engrenage, Spiral, I would imagine the outskirts of Paris are like, you know, pretty rough neighborhoods. They're probably places where police don't usually kind of bother people too much about, you know, what they're doing. So maybe you can get away with a lot more in those kind of areas because things are a little bit more underhand, maybe a bit more under table, like wink, wink, nudge, nudge sort of vibe. I don't really know. Who knows? But regardless, they're churning them out to a kind of high level, which, <laughs> which is, you know, twofold negative positive i guess because on one side it allows someone like myself to get a ticket to go on another side it might be a sign that it's not cool anymore because i'm going <laughs> you know what i mean that might be a clear a clear identification of why it's not cool anymore because i'm actually there because i have to be honest man I've, i took a little clip of, of of the of the event and i'm i'm a real stickler i'm a real real fuddy dud about making sure that you go to things yourself instead of just like rabbiting what other people say about a, a, a thing a venue or whatever and just experiencing it for yourself and seeing if you like it or not and i went there at a good time i think i arrived there like 1 a.m um you know the security search wasn't too crazy the queue wasn't too crazy outdoors didn't you know anything about e1 is that you know you have to the, the, the flipping um cloakroom is outside so at the door to go into it is you have to come outside the building to go into the cloakroom so you know if you're one of those people like myself who likes to kind of like go in and kind of put you know 
uh, pervade the stripping surroundings, see what's happening, and then go cloak room. It's a bit annoying to be inside and then go outdoor to go hang your coat. That's a bit of a annoying thing. But apart from that, easy to get in. And once I got in, once I had a couple of drinks, visited the bathroom a couple of times and just was able to kind of, you know, get my back against the wall and just position up, posted with my, you know, my jacket between my legs and have a bit of a sway and kind of get into the groove, I realized quickly, this isn't for me. I was like closing my eyes, trying to get into it. And this is what I heard. And this is a five minute clip that I recorded, uploaded on YouTube. And I kid you not, it's just the same, the same. The same monotonous beat again and again and again. And again, don't get me wrong. I'm a big techno fan. I know. I've been to Bergheim many times. I've been following this music, dance, electronic music for the best part of, you know, two decades. This is my life's kind of uh, passion outside of many other things that I'm into. It's definitely formed a big part of my kind of social surroundings and what I kind of get up to in terms of the holidays I go to and the friends I have. Cool. I understand that. But let's not be under any illusions. The kind of music that they play at Possession, this kind of hard, techno, hardcore, trancey, whatever vibe they're playing at 140 BPM and up, it really lacks a lot of like, it, I'm, I'm, I think that's what DV, DVS was talking about. It lacks, no, it, it's not even, gro groove is maybe one thing, but it lacks even ingenuity. It's not even like interesting, you know, it's just, don't get me wrong. I understand. I, I think I'm thinking. I was th thinking about it t t today, really, trying to process it in my head, thinking if I was 16 to 23, and I saw for the first time that iconic video of possession party in boiler room. That one has like a million views or something, right? Where people are like standing on tables and on speakers and shit, right? And it was like in the middle of the pandemic, and I was just pissed off with my government i was annoyed i wasn't gonna be able to go to student halls you know i was angsty i was you know just being a, a young person at that person at that time and i stumbled across that video i would be all up in their parties every single weekend whenever they put them on that would be my type of thing because it'd be a great way to kind of get involved in that kind of scene because you'd see it from the grassroots up and it also could maybe speak to my level of frustration that kind of <clears throat> i mean it speaks to that kind of angst um or that wanting to or that wanting to release maybe for the in week usually you're kind of under the thumb of your parents under the thumb of your school under the thumb of your college your university your workplace and then you go out and you're like oh man you're sticking to the man by like shaking your head with your little what, your, what all those all those boys wearing at the party with your little pearls on and your nails painted and your top off and you want to just like you know give it to the man on the dance floor but I don't want to give it to anyone. You know what I mean? I, I just want to have a good time. I want to rave. Maybe, you know, have a little flirt here and there. I don't know. Have a couple of laughs in the smoking area and go home. That's it. I don't want to do anything else. Like, I'm not really in it to, like, you know, um, tap out from a regular everyday life. I think my life is pretty decent. My Monday to Friday isn't that strenuous that it would allow me or that it would require me to go out and it that be the reason why I'm going out is to release and to unplug from all the troubles I have in the No, I don't it's not really that bad for me. It really isn't. Um and I think maybe that's where the disconnect lies. The fact that at the age and stage of my life that I'm at the moment, this kind of music doesn't speak to me in that way. But then outside of that it also just doesn't sound that interesting. It really doesn't. Like, we'll just screw across in this video a little bit more. Maybe it's the wrong type of, you know, I'm the wrong person to kind of use an example because I've only got one clip. It's only a five minute clip, I know, but it doesn't really get more interesting, does it? Someone's taking a top off there. And then it got me thinking as well about this. It got me thinking, like, do we need more gatekeeping in dance music? Like, do we need more um, checks and balances when it comes to what types of night 
get like, push maybe not you know you can't have checks and balances in nightlife because at the end of the day the people vote with their feet they vote with their ticket purchasing right power they could have been anywhere they wanted to be anywhere in london on that given weekend and they all decided to descend at e to e1 which is not again if you're if you're not from the area it's not the easiest place to get to it's not the easiest place to get home from either the cabs and ubers there from there are always expensive even from where i live even to where i live was was i think like 27 pound or whatnot so it's not some sort of thing you decide on a whim. You plan this out. And like I said before, I think you're going to a night like this, including your drugs, your drinking, your cloakroom, your, maybe you're drinking when you get there, pre-drinking when you're at home, your Uber maybe when you get back. You're looking at easily spending £100, easily, to go out there. So it's not like a cheap night. And even if you want to be a cheap night, it's still £50, 50 pounds, which is still not a cheap night regardless. So maybe the fact that people are going there is, you know, is kind of um, gatekeeping enough. It's like they've decided to spend their money in this sort of place. But I just don't know. I think musically, it's just not as interesting as a crowd. That's the thing. The crowd is interesting. Like I bumped into at least five people who came from overseas, like Holland, Italy, France, um, Germany, of course, uh, Spain, somewhere else. Like at least five people separately that I bumped into on the dance floor talking and have, you know maybe sharing your cigarette in the in the smoking area here and there, who said they were from abroad and who wanted to come to a possession party because of the videos they've seen online, because of the hype, because of the Instagram, bloody blah blah blah. And I'm done. And I was just I was in there. Then I tried to think. Okay, look, let me just focus and pick out a DJ that I like. So you know what? Let me let me listen to Charlie Spark because you know random I've seen a few times. So let's let's see what Charlie Sparks is saying. And I think Charlie Sparks, like everyone there, who I kind of don't know, he's the one person who I feel like I would probably have listened to, even if he wasn't, you know, if he didn't have such hype around his name, or if he wasn't associated with the kind of position crew people. I think I would have kind of resonated with Charlie Sparks and what he does. I'm hearing him play. I'm standing by the side of the flipping uh, stage um, next to one of the other bars. And everyone's trying to, you know, beg friends to try and get on the stage to be part of that whole like stage behind dancing thing, which I like, actually. I'm not going to lie. I like because there was a time back in the day when Ricardo Villalobos and the Lucianos and the Seth Troxas even came after the fact and Jamie Jones, when those guys were on top of the world, the culture that existed behind the DJ booth was always like too cool for school, showing off like, oh, we're in a, it's like we're in a VIP area. We're behind the, uh, do you know what I mean? It, it came off as a little bit snobby, right? It came off like they were being cunts. At least with these kids that dance on the stage, they're legitimately dancing. They're legitimately going for it, like sweating their faces off, you know, pupils dilated and just having the time of their life, jaws swinging. They're really partying up there. So it's good to see. So the, the clout of trying to get on stage isn't just to kind of look cool and look down upon people like that meme that people share on flipping dance music pages all over the place, right? With the guy on the flipping balcony, like looking down at the peasants as he's standing behind the DJ booth, even though you're not playing. But it's more so, I'm going to get here so I can kind of have room to dance and show off my dancing skills, show off my flipping body, show off my outfit, regardless. So I'll just kind of show out in general. I love it. I think that energy is good. So, you know, but it was quite cringe still to see people trying to beg friends to go on the stage. It is what it is. Charlie's Box is playing and I'm just sitting there trying to absorb it and trying to have fun. And it's just not happening. It really isn't happening. And then I try to do the same thing that I always do. Like I said beforehand, I'm sitting, I'm back against the wall. I've got my coat between my legs, <coughs> drink in hand, ready to go, closing my eyes, trying to get into the groove of it. I can't. Like, you know, this music's unbop unboppable, I think, in my experience. Unless you just like, you know, it's unboppable. There's no there's no skank that you can do to it. There's nothing it's just it's just, you know, there's nothing to it. It's just da 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 da. Cool. Whatever. Um then um what I try and do. Yeah, then I'm doing that, so I can't get into it. Then I close my I open my eyes, I look to the left to the right of me, and I see a guy going for it, like loving it, smiling. He's pointing to his friend when the tune comes on, like fuck that one that one then i would look to my left um to like towards the stage because i'm standing here i'm here with my back to against the wall and on my right is the bar and here's people in front of me and then to my left is the people on stage and then i'm seeing a girl coming underneath my arms as i'm kind of like you know trying to dance whatever she's oh excuse me and she's holding drinks in her hand and she's smiling so oh, excuse me swaying as she's trying to go into the stage like having a time after she's holding like four drinks in her hand and i'm like yeah it's definitely me it's definitely me these people are absolutely loving it. These kids are having the time of their lives and I can't get into it and I think this is shit. So it's definitely me. But the interesting part of it is I also think 
as unboppable and as uninteresting as the music is, it feels like this might be what we have to listen to for the next five, ten years. This might be the evolution in techno that everyone was kind of waiting for. Everyone's like, you know, what's going to be the new sound? What people are going to be playing? I think this might be it. I think these kids are going to be the new people you start seeing being played in, you know, not residents, but they're going to be people that you'd see in these big places, the, the Bergheims and whatnot, in the main rooms. These are going to be the ones playing, because they're already there anyway, right? The girls from like Malajunta and all those kind of things, it's not too far off from what this sort of sound is. Um, even though I like VTSS and stuff and SPF DJ, those girls, they sound similar to what, again, it's not the same, but that kind of like aggressive non there's, there's no charisma there's no joy there's no yoga bonito i mean there's no like love in it it's just kind of like in your face you know it's it's, it's basically anal music really isn't it? it's just no, i'm saying there's no love in anal but you know what i mean right it's not like romantic it's nothing like there's nothing like exhilarating and it doesn't lift you on a cloud it just kind of just like hits you in the head like ba 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 which is fine right but I want something more, brother. And again, this is coming from somebody who has raved in a Burkine for like a weekend solid and hasn't gone home. Why can you do that? Because they're able to take you on ebbs and flows. But maybe this is the whole point. Maybe this isn't about ebbs and flows. Maybe this is like the equivalent of like um, European Caucasian flipping version of Jungle. This might be it. This might be their version of Jungle where they basically have this music that just kind of only can exist. It's like gr grime sets. Grime sets can't really exist for more than an hour. When they go longer than an hour, they kind of get a bit redundant. But if you have two crews battling each other, you know, bar for bar, sorry, um, on a radio for an hour, it leaves you wanting more. But usually it's the perfect amount. Maybe these DJs, the fact that they can only play for an hour to an hour 20, two hours, maybe tops. And, you know, maybe that's enough. But I don't know, man. This event started at, ele now, what, it started at 11 p.m. or something. Luckily, I didn't go at 11. Luckily, I went at 1, 1 a.m. And by 4, I was already done. But it was 4 a.m. What's the point of leaving? Like, if you're going now and you left your house at 1 and you're, and you're there and it's now 4, there's no point of leaving at 4. You might as well just stay until the end now because, you know, you're here. Um, just kind of ride it out. And I did. Um, and yeah, man, I just wasn't really sold on it at all. I really wasn't sold on it. And I really want to be. And it's kind of making me think, should I even go to the festival? Now, in one part, I think I should, because like I said before, I always wanted to go to a possession in act in Paris, like in its actual um, home country right where it's kind of birthed with people that are really kind of a part of that scene and see how it kind of resonates because maybe it's more of a european thing also because i don't know how many other parties in london play this type of music all day long because that's the one thing we have that's the one kind of good selling point about clubbing in london even if you don't go to the trendy clubs for the most part i've always said I think that we have the best range when it comes to nights out, like genre wise. You could legitimately go to like an indie night, a rock night, a jazz night, hip hop, whatever you want, you could go to it. And usually the interesting part about it also is that even if you went to like an Afrobeats night, it wouldn't mean they're just going to play Afrobeats the whole night. They'll definitely mix into hip hop, some R&B, some pop, some this, whatever, disco. They'd mix it in and that to keep it interesting. So it's like the, what's that place called? Um, the Peckham flipping... Um, garage place that you know that that venue that that's known for having some really interesting nights right throughout the week and throughout the weekend but any night you go there so it's, it's completely different even the night the music played there even if it's just a disco soul train doesn't mean it's just only going to be disco soul train it might be some motown there might be this might be that so i don't know if there's other parties that exist like possession that only played that kind of music all night long i don't know how what it would do but maybe that's the whole appeal. Maybe that's why people came out in their droves because it was rammed. Let me tell you that. It was flipping packed. Packed, packed, packed. Like, they had two rooms, obviously. Then they had the third room, which was a chill-out room, which was, I think was a perfect for that kind of rave because people were off their faces on pingers and whatnot. So it was nice to have, maybe have a place where you can go maybe chill out and kind of recalibrate yourself. And people were taking advantage of it. And on any given moment, it was rammed with people in there. Rammed in that chill-out room. Um, taking it all in or whatnot so credits them where it needs to be but i don't know man i just i don't know i wasn't feeling it man i gotta be honest i really wasn't feeling it and maybe this clip is illustrative of that you know i'm just sat there on the edges of the of the party watching from afar like an old weird man <laughs> while all the kids are having a great time man i don't know it's made me think should i but maybe i should go to the paris one just so i can see it in that sort 
in, in its actual locality. And obviously it'll give me a chance to, to go to visit the kind of outskirts of Paris, which I've always wanted to go to, especially being a fan of um, Spiral, that series called Engrenage. I would love to go and see what those kind of areas are like, the no-go zone areas, see what all these kind of, you know, North African dons kind of run those kind of um, areas I like and whatnot out front, you know, with the tracks and what, hopefully I don't get jacked, you know what I mean? All those kind of vibes. That would be quite cool to see, but god damn it the music of these kind of things though i don't know man it's a bit wild but look at the hands the video's playing now and there's plenty of hands like really going for it and loving it loving it loving it loving it so maybe i'm in the minority well i know i am well well i know i'm in the minority i know because you know it's just me talking Yeah, man the kids loved it the kids loved it i didn't love it too much i guess it is what it is isn't it what can you do um met some cool people there though to be fair so big up everyone that i bumped into i think that was an absolute barnstorming night for terms of conversation and adding random people onto my instagram so that was nice so i have a couple of friends i bumped into a couple of people actually from berlin who i'll probably end up visiting um or bumping into or maybe kind of hanging out with when i do end up going out there again later on this year so that might have been a net positive but yeah overall music i'm not a big fan of production level and how they put the event together bravo again flawless event no complaints there um great to see all the young kids out again you know looking cool um great outfits on and just kind of having a great time that was also incredible to see uh, but apart from that nothing more to add on that regard let's just leave it there on that one because i don't want to expose my age you know what i mean by by just going on rants about this sort of stuff but i don't know man it wasn't what I expected it to be. I have to be completely honest. Now, moving on, we got news, of course, on the club in front to continue. Um, news courtesy of Resident Advisor. News that obviously most of you guys would know that I would be happy about, and a lot of people that actually live in flipping Berlin should be way more happy about in terms of their day to day and their overall mental health. Berlin clubbing returns on the March 4th. Berlin clubs can reopen on March 4th no restrictions well, no kind of capacity restrictions or stuff or no masks needed but the 2g plus rule applies which basically means you have to be vaccinated or have re recently recovered from corona before you can go in there right so standard sort of procedure but bloody hell man it's been a long time coming for them lot in it so it says here courtesy of ra clubbing in berlin is back on friday the march 4th after the return of dancing in germany was confirmed on the federal level last week the berlin senate ratified the decision earlier today february 22nd dancing indoors has been banned in the capital since early december early december and i was lucky enough to go when when did i go i think i might have went in like october november to Berghain and then to paloma and stuff so i was able to slip in just before it kind of got crazy jesus man um there will be no mask on social distancing though the 2g plus rules attendees must be vaccinated or have recovered from covid19 will still apply everyone must also show a negative antigen test result regardless whether they have booster shot or not so that's the interesting part because if i'm not mistaken i did remember seeing an article somewhere that said something like oh if you want to have a covid vaccine pass to go to europe and for it to be valid you're going to have to have a booster shot like it won't it won't validate unless you have the third shot um i think i read something on those kind of lines i'm not sure if that's correct but i've heard if you're gonna go to an eu country that's gonna be the rule but either way <coughs> regards to the rule the fact that it's open again is a blessing especially now heading into the summer season it gives these guys an opportunity to make some money especially with like the may day celebrations coming up in april and whatnot do you know what i mean these guys are gonna need to have an option or the ability to kind of be able to go um put on events and whatnot um you know the what you call it the the markets on the outdoors and the weekends what all these kind of things that have been really really missed um that kind of revolve around that whole area are going to be welcome when they go back in and continues to said various venues in berlin will also have also already announced a party such as club ost um hop tosser that kind of boat thing on the side of the river um, i have not been to anon 
and non and no Mali. I've not been to Funk House. I've been to Paloma and I've been to Panke, of course. Other stations in Germany have also ratified in March 4th for opening date, including Hamburg and North Rhine West Westfela. Here's a post from the Berlin Club Commission. So the Berlin Club Commission, a lot of people in the comments have a lot of bad things to say about the Berlin Club Commission. I've heard some really, no, on the comments of the Berlin Club Commission page and whatnot. But yeah, they looks like they came through. They delivered. Um, they did something behind the scenes to basically get ratified. And now hopefully the clubs will reopen. Um, hopefully they also have some contingent contingencies in place that would allow them to have an idea of what would happen if there is another spike. Because one of the sad things i remember reading about germany and berlin and stuff and clubbing was i forgot who it was but some club owner was like oh everyone's like coming up to me saying oh how happy i must be to for clubs to be reopened but as my happy as i am i'm also sad because i've lost some of my best stuff and then you forget that places like berlin or other places in europe they take clubbing very seriously and it's an actual economy right and people actually have careers working behind the scenes and the industry whether it be for a record distribution company a flipping agency a club whatever they actually involved in the kind of nuts and bolts of that scene so for them for work to be completely shut and for you to be on furlough and stuff it might make you question your life's choices and it might make you decide to maybe i don't know do that thing you've always been having on the back burner but you haven't because you've been having this all-encompassing career in nightlife that hasn't allowed you to be able to go and do a course on the weekend or have to be distracted so it's kind of made you it's kind of made your decision for you because you're working effectively sunday to sunday so then the moment you kind of put those guys on ice and you tell them to sit down for a bit and go and furlough most likely if they've got other interests they're going to pursue it and they might not go back to clubs again but those people are legitimately the bedrock of that clubbing space or that community so to lose them it's probably worse than being closed because those guys and girls were the ones that made your club what it was. And without them, it doesn't, you know what I mean? Like just having people that work in there for, for the sake of it, it's not the same thing. It doesn't, doesn't kind of give the same sort of vibe. I, I imagine the same sort of thing in most major metropolitan city especially when you've got like a popping club, like it's usually never the lineup. It's usually everything to do with the that surrounds the club whether the people that go there the you know the people that hang around there the people that are associated with it but it's never the lineup of the actual people that are playing there so when you lose those kind of core members it can be a bit bittersweet when you're kind of open again because you know you're not gonna get those back and you know those people are gonna be in demand they might go to other places they might have changed their life choices in general they might have popped out some babies and shit passed away who knows you know what i mean so um, hopefully they have some contingency to plan to kind of allow them to not be in that position again if they do end up closing but yeah berlin my spiritual second home is back open that's great there'll be a time in my lifetime definitely where i've kind of put down on my goal list to have an apartment in berlin and an apartment here that'll definitely be there it regards to what ends up in my life i definitely would like to have those things options in place and obviously when i'm not they'll be able to kind of airbnb out or whatnot but definitely have that in place so that i'll be able to kind of go when i need to when i need to have a place i can kind of rock up in and just kind of chill out it doesn't matter what it were it could be in prince lauerberg or flipping you know wedding i'm not really too bothered but it'll be cool just to have a little permanent residency there that i can kind of go or semi-permanent that i can kind of go back and back and forth to especially given that most of my work is kind of done through via laptop anyway so um I'm, you know, obviously I'd like to be in a position where I don't need to work nine to five so I don't need to kind of be at a particular place working but um, the fact that we're in this world now at the moment where remote working is a thing will be cool but just in general it'd be great to have that kind of thing as a goal to kind of kind of strive for going forward but yeah pick up everyone that lives in Berlin at the moment March 4th clubs reopen if you care about that get involved if you care about that get involved so next thing to talk about quickly um yeet 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 oh uh, oh uh. um this guy popped out of nowhere um i listened to the first album which was what oh what's the bloody name of the first album uh, 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 uh. the first album i stumbled i don't know how i stumbled across it maybe it was on a forum yeah the first album i stumbled across on was an album called up to me right this album called up to me and yeah i liked it i enjoyed it um i thought it was very interesting sonically wise um i thought it might have sounded a little bit reductive a little bit copycat in the kind of the lane of kind of playboy carty sort of thing 
but I understood it. You know, these young kids coming up, people like Carti are going to be a big inspiration to you because clearly in that kind of field, in that genre, in that, in that kind of zone that he makes music, he's one of a kind. And there's not a lot of people that are making music of that quality or that level. So clearly, if you're going to be inspired by anyone, you're going to be inspired by him. Makes sense. But then it also got me thinking about Yeet, similar to what I have said about the possession party, about maybe this is a good indication, like if you ever you needed one, of how old you're getting, of how you react to stuff like this. Because this album, this new album called Two Alive, that just came out the other day, <coughs> it actually leaked in its entirety like a couple of days before that, which is fucking nuts. It seems to happen quite often with a lot of these younger sort of like rappers. A lot of their albums just seem to drop in this entirety before they're actually meant to release, which leads me to believe that maybe a lot of it is kind of like planned and it's all kind of part of the whole troll marketing campaign that they do. Because trolling now is kind of, is, is basically a marketing campaign at the moment. I mean, Doja Cat and Lil Nas X are probably two of the flipping experts at doing that sort of thing at the moment. But um, And also he had this flipping thing recently where he put on a concert um, as, at a venue in LA, which from what I've gathered from people that live over there or in America, that allegedly the capacity of this venue was far over anything that he w was, was far too small for any performance he could have put on. So clearly the label maybe did it on purpose where they put on a performance. So they, they booked a, a, a performance for him to, they booked a venue where he could go and perform his sort of like kind of his new album. And the hope was that pe loads of people would turn up. And I think if I'm not mistaken, also he put on his Instagram page, oh, if you don't have a ticket, turn up anyway. So did the whole Travis Scott rage sort of thing. Clearly, you know, luckily it wasn't fatal, the consequences, but they clearly did that as a kind of marketing campaign where if you book a venue that's smaller than capacity that you can, but that's kind of smaller than what you actually need, it's going to be oversubscribed. Then you tell your artist to go and put that Instagram story, telling people to come anyway if they don't have tickets and you're going to get them in. And then it's going to lead to people, you know, going crazy on the streets, roadblocks, police, sirens, helicopters, you know, perfect materials for like a bit of B-roll on a new music video or whatnot. And just to kind of add to the overall kind of allure of the guy. But um, yeah, this new Two Alive, like I said, if you want uh, if you want an indication of how old you're getting, listen to Yeet Two Alive um, and you'll definitely get an indication of whether or not you're young or old. Because I feel like for me, I thought Up To Me was a far better album musically i felt like it was the tracks were more interesting to listen to but then i think if you listen to two alive from the beginning to the end it feels more like a vibe it's a lot more like it it, it kind of sounds like to me perfect music to get to to flipping get higher to smoke something on pills whatever else you like to take drinks whatever else it definitely is on that kind of lane more so than it is for up to me that kind of again i thought sounded like a traditional kind of new era sort of hip-hop type mixtape -y type thing whereas this two alive definitely sounds like turn up music and it got me thinking a lot about whole or red by playboy carty an album that i originally didn't like when it first came out but then the more that i listened to it the more that I started seeing performances of him performing it live in front of an audience, it kind of tried to take another life of his own, which is weird because usually I'm the biggest Playboy Carti fan. Like, you know, I still maintain that Die Lit might have been, you know, one of the greatest albums to come out of the last 10 years or whatnot. Do you know what I mean? Incredible, genre-defying album. Um, probably his effects are going to be felt for years and years and years to come. But when Whole Lot of Red came out, don't get me wrong, I wasn't, it wasn't like I was expecting him to make Die Lit 2. But it just didn't sound as interesting. And even the songs, I don't think a lot of people can argue that Dialit has way better songs on it than what Whole Lot of Red does. But Whole Lot of Red is such a unique vibe, sonically, emotionally, and kind of performative wise, how he kind of puts a show on. It kind of just has a whole different life to itself. Like, that's why I've always kind of wondered why, whether or not, why these guys, especially the people like this type, like Yee and stuff, who make this kind of vibe music. Why don't, they just, why don't they put out live albums or live DVDs or whatever or something or London's kind of lies? Or, why not? Because when I, when I was listening to metal back in the day, or when I used to go to metal festivals, you know, the likes of Pippin Iron Maiden were, you know, notorious for putting out incredible live albums of their tours that they'd kind of done. You know, notorious tours and maybe parts of South America and whatnot that went off really well, that were well received. They would obviously take it's a lot of money to record a live show, don't get me wrong, but they'd package it together in a way that would make it kind of interesting for fans that weren't able to go to a flipping Buenos Aires or whatnot. 
and it would also give the album that they might have maybe not liked another opportunity to kind of live again like you breathe new life into an album that might have not been received as well and i feel like to me personally to me playboy carty's whole lot of red definitely benefited greatly from him doing live performances i think if he wasn't able to put on those live shows that album would have been a dud it wouldn't have recovered I think the fact that there were live shows came back and he was able to perform in that interesting way with the flipping, you know, the, with that Jeep on the on the stage that Kanye gave him, coming out with the guy in the guitar, improvising tracks. Like, it, it, like, even the performances, you look from the first performance at the Narcissist tour to the end, to the last one I think they did in maybe Atlanta or whatnot, the you know the, the show evolved over the over the time and people w- knew what to expect they were going in there with the high expectations the set list was interesting blah 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 but again vibe music so i think when it comes to yeet i would maybe like to see how this resonates with a crowd in the actual audience because when i listen to it i just think to myself like this is perfect music to get high on be in your room somewhere lights dimmed right lighting a candle and just having a you know having a bit of a closed eye session that way but is it really turn up music? I'm not too sure if it is. Um, but the one thing we can't deny is that Yeet as an artist is in a very <coughs> unique, interesting place because as much as he sounds like a Playboy Carti clone, I also think in terms of his fan appeal, it kind of reminds me a little bit of that like, young lean. It doesn't have people are so rabidly fans of his, even though he hasn't put out that much music or he hasn't been around that long. And the fact that he looks the way he does, I think if I'm not mistaken, he's like half, you know, to put it plainly, I think he's more than that, but he's basically half Romanian, half Mexican, but he's got more of a Romanian, European type looking face, which I think is going to lend very well to the European market because we already saw what, um 6 9 did when he came over to Europe like he was really popular like more popular than people would actually would have imagined him to be when he came to Europe and obviously his legal troubles maybe have put a kind of stop to that or maybe the fact that he doesn't make music may put a stop to that I don't really know but I think Ye might end up being a very rich man very quickly based on how he's able to kind of parlay this hype on the internet into live shows into tours and then into going abroad overseas because i think if he's able to smash overseas and tour places like belgium france italy like germany and shit like he is going to be cleaning up like you know scandinavia like come on this guy will clean up this sound kids love it (coughs) especially the newer kids coming up and i heard someone saying oh it's too derivative it's too copycat clark carty but think think about it right think if you're a kid and you're the age between like I don't know, 14 and 23. And, you know, Dialit has come out and then a you know, whole lot of Reds come out. That That's maybe the benchmark of that, the high count. And, and maybe to you, Playboy Kai, when you're that age, he's maybe like the Jay-Z of the, of the level, right? He's super, super stardom. But you want to get someone new of your own because that's what always happens in music. You want to find a new artist of your own that you can kind of champion and get behind and kind of watch their rise. But if you jumped on the Carti vibe, by the time Holo already came out, it's already too late. Do you know what I mean? The hype's already gone. He's an established artist. You're not really part of that journey anymore. So when you see someone like a Yeet come along, you can jump on at the beginning. It sounds quite similar. It's also very different in its own way. And it's easy to turn up to. It's not really offensive. Like it doesn't, I don't know. I, I never got the need to kind of turn it off. It was a perfect music to have again. In the background, if you're getting high, in the gym somewhere, if you're working out, on your commute it's just easy kind of like music to kind of like pop your head to a couple of features might stand out here and there obviously young fugs feature on the second track outside is really fantastic but apart from that it all kind of flows into each other with all the songs they all kind of blend into each other they don't really stand out as much as up to me i thought did i thought up to me had some really good standout tracks that kind of jumped out at you and kind of got your attention but I can kind of understand why kids like it. I can understand why older people can think this stuff is garbage because it doesn't really say anything of merit um, or anything worthwhile to kind of like sit down and think, oh yeah, man, that's a deep bar. There's some bar about Nipsey Hustle that's just like, you know, throw away, whatever. Um, but I think if he's able to play it smart, he's able to take this internet hype into live shows, take that into touring, take that into going overseas, he's going to destroy Europe and he will be very rich in very short space of time. He might end up doing what Pop Smoke did. No, sorry, what um Lil Pump did 
in terms of that ability to make a high amount of money in a very short period of time. Obviously, Lil Pump was aided a lot because of that whole contract thing he did, right? Where I think he got finagled into signing a deal when he was underage. Then he got new management and they were able to get him compensation and get him out of the deal because he was underage and signed that deal. So that was a clever little thing that he was able to kind of spin back and kind of use to his advantage. But apart from that, he did make a very, he did make a lot of money in a short space of time. Now, the only thing I worry about him is that if you're an artist musically and if you really, really want to kind of expand your sound and, you know, be a bit more interesting, does he have that in him? I'm not too sure. Can he kind of... Is Are there other levels to yeet? I don't know if there are. Does it matter? Who knows if it does? Maybe this is the whole point of the new sound or this new generation that we're kind of living amongst. Maybe they're just happy to kind of run it up, be able to cash in their checks, you know, take their mamas out of their project housing or whatnot, you know, give their boys some money and then keep it moving. That's probably enough. And if you're, you know, if you're kind of um, savvy enough with your investments and stuff and you're able to make, you know, 10 million plus or whatnot, you could effectively not have to work for life if you invest that in the right places. Just off your Instagram alone, you could probably be able to recoup a lot of money during you know I mean? sponsorships and ads and whatnot. So the sky is obviously the limit, but I can never understand why people don't like it, but it's definitely a reminder of like how old you get when you hear this sort of stuff. You're like, what is this? Like, it doesn't even sound interesting. Not great. The musical blends into each other, but I liked it. I, I, I got to be honest, I liked it, but I still think Up To Me um, was far better as an album overall, in my personal opinion. But, you know, what do I know? Let's jump on into this and move. Let's talk about this one. Yeah, let's talk, let's jump on this one. This is talk about this one. So this is funny. This is courtesy of The Verge. This is the following. Twitter's new CEO is taking a few weeks of paternal leave and should feel free to take even more. I don't know what the hell this is all about. I don't get this whole like new thing happening now where guys are taking off are taking time off from work to look after their kids, especially when they have more than one kid. It's one thing if it's your first child and you want to maybe be there for his first steps and the connection and the bond and you have the ability to do so. Okay, cool, do it. But if it's your second kid, that seems super sussy and I don't know. I don't get it. It says, yeah, Twitter CEO um, Parag Ag Agrawala. Is that how you said it? Parag Agrawal. Par Parag Agrawal, yeah? Um, plans to take a few weeks of paternity leave for the birth of his second child. The company confirmed on Wednesday. First report in Washington Post, um, Agralau announced that he was um, taking a leave of comp comp company all hands meeting last week, <coughs> although he apparently will take less than the full 20 weeks that Twitter provides. Oh, thank you. It says that Twitter, we encourage and fully support employees to take parental leave in whatever ways works best for each person, says Laura Yagman, the head of corporation. It's a personal decision and we created a parental leave program supporting up to 20 weeks of flexible leave that is customizable for that reason. She added that Agrarao, who is a executive sponsor to Twitter's internal company's community plans to be connected with the company's executive team during the leave. So basically we have his Slack open. Um, Pagrarao, Pagrala, Parag, 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 let's just say Parag. Parag has um, been in the top job of Twitter since November when co-founder Jack Dorsey resigned. The Post reports he has not named an interim CEO to handle day to day as he is out of office, of course. Um, while many but not all private companies offer at least what some type of paid leave for their new parents, several states have paid parental leave policies. The United States continues to be the largest country in the world. <coughs> that does not have national paid parental leave policy according to most recent study from the world policy LNS analysis center the average paid maternity leave around the world is 29 weeks and the average paternity leave is 16 weeks uh among tech companies several high profile co-founders and ceos have made a point to take parental leave mark zuckerberg uh the, the co-founder alex onion of reddit did it also Research shows that a national paid leave in the United States would have a plethora of benefits for children and families. Yeah, of course. Usually when a mother takes time off, I don't know I'm not too sure how many benefits they're gonna be in place when a dad does take time off. Um, I don't know. I think it's strange. Um, especially with the second child. 
um, unless he's not with his partner or it's some it's some it's some new kind of um, relationship thing that they have going on there. I'm not really too sure, but I think it's a bit lame to be honest, in my opinion. But again, who am I to judge with no children? Who am I to judge? Then we move on to the Verge. It says the following: Spotify is acquiring two major podcast tech platforms. This might explain why they decided to bet so heavy on Rogan and didn't bow to all the cancelling requests that everyone had on him, which has kind of died down completely, right? Everyone was calling Joe Rogan a racist, saying he shouldn't be on Spotify, he had to go sponsor this and blah de blah blah blah. And look what happened. You wait long enough, you don't say sorry, you just kind of keep doing what you need to be done, and people sooner than rather than later move on to the next thing. But this is for me is a clear indication that Spotify were never going to drop Rogan because I think they're betting really big on podcasts. They've seen the numbers. They've seen the margins. They've seen the scope of it. It's growing and growing. Even someone like myself, who's a DJ, who's an avid listener of music, I find myself listening to more podcasts per week than I do listen to music. So for sure, they've got data from their end where they can kind of see that sort of thing being kind of reflected in the numbers. So it was never on the cards. I don't think that they were ever going to get rid of Rogan. Um, and this obviously is further proof of it. Let's read the article. <clears throat> it says as follows. Spotify is making more podcast acquisitions. The company announced today it's acquiring both Chartable and Podsites, two of the most prominent podcast and marketing and attribution companies. The deal price has not been disclosed, but this marks the first major acquisition the company has made this year in a long time of, in a long line of audio purchases. Both Podsites and Chartable allow podcasters and networks to indulge Sorry, to include tags in their shows that are used to track who listens if they hear if they heard an ad and whether they took action upon hearing it. Spotify says it plans to use podcast technology outside of podcasting and will bring it into full scope of the Spotify platform, including audio ads within music ads, so music video ads and display ads. The charitable acquisition appears to be more directed towards podcasters themselves rather than advertisers, particularly because of its technology like the smart links. The deal is particularly critical to the company as it tries to make its platform the best and most powerful in audio. It wants people um, to purchase ads through its marketplace. Then it needs everyone. Then it needs the technology to better figure out who's listening to the ads and what they're doing when they're hearing them. At the same time, marketing analytics are critical to show creators who want to ensure they're spending their budgets well. The deal depth. The deal helps both creators and advertisers to group Spotify reads and needs wants to court. So obviously this is a big kind of pull and big indication of where things are going in the long term. And um it then even just shows you how fast this podcasting space is growing. Um I've added so many new podcasts to my kind of listening, weekly listening kind of arsenal even though I usually still listen to the same five to 10 shows per week on a kind of regular basis. Um, but I can only imagine what other people are doing out there, especially with their free time, especially people that don't like music because there's many of them that exist who just don't really care about music or anything. Um, so if that's the case, then, you know, if you're not watching TV and you're not on your phone, next best thing to do, especially if you want some background noise, is to whack on a podcast. So that definitely makes complete sense for me in that regard. So yeah, big up Spotify for getting the job done on that one i guess big up them man what else we want to talk about here um ba, 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 ba. we got this we got that we got this oh let's talk about this quickly yeah who's ready for some more l's who's ready for some more l's you get an L, you get an L, you get an L, you get a, Who's ready for more L's? You want more L's? Yeah, just, you know, give us more L's. We want more L's. Okay, here's some more L's. Boom, boom, boom. News courtesy of Hypebeast. Jound announces its New Balance 990 V3 made Olive collaboration is coming out soon. So if you couldn't get hold of any other pairs from the John the New Bands collection and you were eagerly scratching your arms like a flipping fiend, ready to get your next hit to try and disappoint yourself all over again, John they're here to supply your needs. And they've got another pair, a olivey kind of green colorway that looks absolutely banging, but more likely than not, 
none of us will be able to purchase, unfortunately. Especially in this outfit too, with the gilet, um, you know, over the flipping, the olive uh, quilted gilet over the flipping white t-shirt with some track pants on. You know, classic, classic sneakerhead looks, right? It looks really, really nice. But I just dread the amount of people that are going to be trying to get these things. Given the color too, they're going to be shoes that I think will appeal to a wide, 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 wide consumer base because mostly everyone can wear a pair of these shoes and make them work. They're not really that kind of, you know, crazy compared to other collaborations that you see out there. But Jound in general, anyway, usually do stuff a bit more um, subdued and a little bit more uh, plain in that regard. So that's definitely going to be a thing. And as per usual, with every failed release, it just adds more demand to the next release. Ask Travis Scott, he will tell you. Do you know what I mean? That's what it does. It's a it's a kind of tried and tested method throughout the years um to garner more kind of, you know, uh bucks from the flipping sneakerheads. But oh, they look so nice in it. As bitter as I can sound, they just they no denying they look absolutely lovely, don't they? From the top there with their sort of off white laces. They look really, really good. What's in the hill type there? Same thing there? No, it's the same. Oh yeah, that says John, but just NB on there really really nicely done I have to be honest really nicely done the, the branding on the shoe isn't that crazy also they didn't go you know down flipping everywhere it's kind of done in a very artistic tasteful way the box is really nice too it looks like um, is that in gold foil or gold finger it's just like a print just like a print okay cool that would be nice if it did that, 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 that. It had like a white box with like a gold um new balance logo silver new balance logo in bust on it and whatnot but maybe not who knows but yeah let's read the article quickly it says as follows the montreal clothing based no the montreal based design agency and digital mood board has garnered imagine that be your occupation what do you get what, what do you get paid to do like gather images on the internet that are not mine and put them together in the mood board and have people pay me for my opinions and stuff that is life that is a life um it says the, the 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 cult following for crafting and minimal and versatile sneaker editions. It will be reunited with New Balance for yet another team up this month. After linking up with the Navy nine nine zero V fours, it uh, iteration of October twenty one. The entities have recorded so reconvened to announce their latest giant collaboration. The installment is a follow up on the nine nine zero V three collab from twenty eighteen. And it departs from the neutral, heavy arrangement of the palette more designed to with the jack with the spring seasoning. Oh my, I'm messing up words so much. Sorry, we're just going through that again. Uh, John makes use of tonal and olive hues as a leading component, and it splashes it across with a breathable mesh and underlays and new buck overlays. Adjacent to this comes a stark black N logo on the side, along with a creamy laces and reflective panels atop a tongue and a rear. And John branded printed on the heels and the shoes uh, inserts for subtle flair. End cap midsoles are found in the lower half and come style with white cream and silver color blocking check out a detailed look at the pair above and note that these will be dropping on jound on february 24th 12 p.m edt and on march 3rd via select new balance retailers retail prices set at 250 dollars damn it but <coughs> again i don't have an issue with this i think they make fairly decent retros or whatever you might call it a v3 and 9904 um new balance i mean they're very well made the shape's pretty decent the material's always good so cool i'll pay the 250 i'll do the same thing for nike if nike made a patter exclusive air max one and they used the best materials they had the best shape going for the air max one in the retro they actually went and re-engineered a flipping air max one or air max 87 wherever they got hold of and they re-engineered it from the ground up, tore it to pieces, and remade the tooling, and said, hey, here you go. This is the Air Max um, flipping from pattern that we designed with Nike, and it's going to be priced at $300. I'd be there with my credit card out, ready to go. Happy to do it, but they don't. So, <coughs> you know, it is what it is, I guess. But yeah, they look flipping brilliant. I like them. They look banging. The shoot looks obviously great too. They style the kid really well. They they have some. They have really good casting when it comes to Jound. 
um, doing their product pictures and whatnot. I like it, even though I don't like his little one toe thing that he did there on toe. But it is what it is. Let him live. I do really like what they've done in terms of styling. They do it really, really bloody well. No denying that at all. No denying that whatsoever. So yeah, keep an eye out for those if you're that way inclined. Keep an eye out for those if you're that way inclined. Um, what else to talk about here? What time is it? So I'll double check, make sure I'm not going too overboard here. Cool. Next, we have news courtesy of Hype Beast as well regarding the official look at Drake's Nocta Air Hot No Nike Air Noc Drake's Nocta and Nike Hot Step Air Max Terra or Hot Step Air Terra right? Hot Step Air Terra Black. And I like them. They might be even better than the white color, actually, which obviously makes complete sense considering I'm such a whore for black trainers anyway. But in terms of an overall shape, in terms of their overall appeal, how they designed, I quite like them, I'm not going to lie. Um, since debuting his Nocta line with Nike in December 2020, Drake has steadily been growing his catalog with various batches of apparel. The time has finally come for the OVO artist to drop his toes in the footwear category and a Nocta Air Hot Step of Terror having been teased by the certified lower boy since 2021 the signature will be dropping the triple white and triple black as colorways it's most oh, sorry it's founder has always been just a shown sorry the, the 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 latter the latter of which just has been shown by an official imagery the minimal and dark arrangement of the kicks aligns seamlessly with the nonchalant. Okay, it's gone too many words for this short shit. What's the date? We've got date March 3rd, $180. But yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of them. I'm not going to lie. I, I think they look really, really good. If anything, the only problem I have with them is maybe the bulbous side on the side of it here. There's a lot of extra material because obviously it's been sort of like quilted and whatnot. It just looks a little bit bulbous here. Maybe it's just me being picky. That's the only thing I'd say that's kind of slightly annoying about it. Once you see, you can't stop it. Like this bit here, see? It's just too much. Uh, what else is happening here? Oh, more pictures again of the hill. What's the hill logo thing? What's that say there? That looks really, that's a logo. The logo looks really nice, okay. But yeah, I'm not too bad at them. Not, I don't mind them. Not my favorite, obviously, but they will do. They will do. I think that's an hour already, already in. Let's yeah, that's an hour. Let's end it right there. Don't want to waste too much more of your time. I'm gonna have another one coming up at the back of this anyway, so let's just double up twice in a row. Thanks again for tuning in to Action Show episode number five five eight. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If you listen to this podcast, you hear a great song at the end. And if you're watching this show on video and you see my face, you know, smash one in the in the comments, please do. And the video just end just like this.